always says something I should say out front at the top. Like, I, it's very, it's a very powerful thing to be the person between the room of people and the happy hour. So thank you for, for bearing with us over the next 45 minutes. Um, when we had our initial uh, getting to know you chat, although I know all three of you, but um, when we talked about what we wanted to talk about today, uh, we easily took up an hour. And I could have gone for another hour, if I'm honest. So I'm hoping there are a lot of questions. Um, and I know we won't be able to get to them all today, but we all will be around. And um, talking about the experiments that you're doing and you want to do, or that um, you three have had experience with is the best way to kind of learn, share information, to kind of lift the entire space up together, which is something that I care very deeply about. Um, I think uh, something that I think the conversations today have been rooted in is how experiments and testing um, have brought together cross-organizational teams to do some really interesting work. And they've been a, a key education point about what revenue generation means for, for non nonprofit and public media. Um, and I think uh, it's something that came up in our conversations as well. Um, Rebecca, like, you don't have a, a membership or fundraising role. It'd be no. super interesting to talk about how you even, <laughs> how do you end up on the stage today? Right. So I don't work in membership, and I actually don't work on our podcast team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also, in addition to being digital director at NHPR, I also have a podcast business that I run from my home. And that has really been my sandbox to learn everything I know about podcast monetization, advertising, donations, tip jars, uh, live events, newsletter subscriptions, um, you know, the different tools that are out there available. And I've been lucky enough with my collaborator, Maureen McMurray, who runs our on-demand content unit, to really be in the room and help drive some of our experiments and fundraising forward. And how does it, I mean, um, coming to something sort of as an independent creator, having your own fundraising things, is it how much of a different experience is it to be doing it within the public media, public radio space? Yeah, it's it's both wonderful and incredibly frustrating uh, because, you know, I'm very inspired by Andy McDaniel, by the way, and her incredible honesty on the stage. So I hope you don't mind if I kind of go there. Um, indie podcasters uh, are where public radio should be looking for how to do this. I mean, that's just the way that it is. There are some very small shows out there in the world using existing tools to capitalize on their small but loyal audiences and making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And it can be really hard when you're working in public radio where the membership model is rightly uh, sort of based on these long-term relationships, on monthly sustaining commitments to translate that you know, somebody's hijacked our model and is doing it better for us on this platform for this kind of content that we are positioned to make better content mm -hmm. than they are positioned to make. So, you know, first I saw Slate, which isn't an indie, obviously, sort of steal the public radio membership <laughs> model for their Slate Plus program and employ it to incredible success using relatively low tech tools. And now I see indie shows, again, making, you know, creating buckets of monetization for their podcasts, ads plus Patreon plus events, and really capitalizing, doing very simple things, personal asks. Uh, and you know, really working and overserving those relationships, and um, we as a as a system are slower to adopt those models for a, for a large variety of reasons. I mean, part of it has to do with the fact that, like, while I as an independent creator can work ten extra hours a week on a project that's revenue designed, we can't ask a producer or somebody else who's already working fifty hours a week to put in those ten hours. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different, obviously, resource wise, but. Yeah, there has been a little bit of conflict, sort of, um, and I don't think it's just me and my station. I think anybody who's sort of creating podcasts within stations has probably felt a little bit of this. Yeah. And I'm just going to, something I probably should have said, I think we don't have the slide out on the board here, but if you do go, is it true that if you go and use uh, BizLab 5, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm hearing, um, <laughs> that you can pop your questions in there as they come up, so uh, you don't have to hold on onto anything too tight. Um, Amira, uh, you're coming from a very different background as well. Um, it would be great to give like a real tiny like little pitch of like what Glow is and and the problem you are trying to help solve um, through your conversations with the with the public media and the independent podcast space. Yeah. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Glow.fm, and 
we are a purpose-built product specifically to help podcasts build their membership and subscription model. So we'll do, we're turnkey, we'll accept payment if you want us to accept payment and make that incredibly easy to do. Um, but we'll also make it easy to pay while bonus content or provide exclusive content to your listeners in a way that's really seamless for them. So it's you know call to action, three clicks, and they've already paid with a recurring or one-time payment and have access to bonus content. And we can piecemeal any one part of that. So if you only want to use it for payment, that's great. If you just want to use this to easily distribute bonus content, we can do that as well. Um, I came at it as a podcaster myself. So I started off just across the river here with a local news podcast called Backyard Cambridge. And I developed an audience. And what I wanted to do was develop a membership model uh, where people would pay for the podcast, almost like a newspaper. And as I looked around, I realized there was really no great way to do that in a way that put my brand first, in a way that made it really easy to distribute extra content to my listeners and maybe add on uh, an extra newsletter. And so, so that's what we do. We're a turnkey solution specifically designed for, for this problem. And you spend a lot of time obviously pitching and, and trying to sell Glow FM up to people. But in, in that process and with the clients that you work with, you know, I, I would imagine like anybody, you, you take on that role of a therapist a little bit. Yeah. And so like what are the, the common kind of roadblocks that you're hearing when you're starting to have those conversations about, well, what is the technology piece to help me like get the money, like even before you get to that part? Yeah, our, our goal is to make technology not be the problem. So we've, we've really solved as well as we can to make it very easy to get started, very easy to charge your listeners, really easy to collect failed credit card payments and distribute that premium content. So, so yeah, we end up just playing the role of therapist a lot. And the number one question that people come to us and ask is, is what can I offer in exchange for my membership? What do people really want? And so we end up spending a lot of time really talking through a lot of the same lessons that Joan was talking to this morning, which is how do I find what we call content market fit? How do you know what your listeners really want and make it possible to give something back to them that is something they value. And, and as you all know, it's all about crafting a call to action that really demonstrates what that value is. And the value can be anything. I mean, some of our most successful podcasts are just really good at saying, your money's going to go towards paying our producer. This is who our producer is. She deserves to be paid. Um, and that's that. And we just get really great donations from that. Or we have podcasts that offer really awesome bonus content twice a month and see anywhere, our average conversion rates are between one to 5% of total audiences converting to monthly conversion. And so you know, we have podcasts that are ten dollars to $20,000 an episode making $40,000 a year using our platform just for bonus content through that mm -hmm. kind of conversion piece. And so once we tell them what the possibilities are and how to really zero in on what value they can offer their listeners, it becomes a lot easier to start to unlock that. And so we've one thing that we've done in that therapy piece is we built out a launch playbook that we're going to we're going to release the first version of next week to help people walk through that set of questions of, of what can I offer? How do I pinpoint my offering? How do I figure out the right call to action and design my whole membership around that value offering? That's great. And and Kirsten, I, I think um, your I, I think the title of your role doesn't well, it doesn't <laughs> re reflect the podcast space, but I think it does reflect how um, public radio stations are thinking about that hedging where the audience is going, that digital place. And I think for a lot of uh, stations mm -hmm. of different sizes, that is where their podcast membership team have grown out of. It would be super interesting to hear about how you approach that KUOW and, and kind of what that looks like within the station for you. Yeah, we are always testing and always trying new things. It's exciting and terrifying all at once. And with our podcast fundraising in particular, um, I started about a year and a half ago, and my title's Digital Fundraising Officer, which is nobody really knows exactly what that means. But uh, uh, so one of the things that I, I was approached by our podcast and marketing team and was like, can we just get a dedicated donation form so that we can put out an ask on our host channels and in the episode so that we're able to track some level of success. And so I was actually approached by our content team, which I was immensely grateful for. Um, and I was like, yeah, let me throw that together to you, for you. What do we want it to look like? Um, and so we did that. It was one in-episode ask and a couple of social media asks, and that generated $6,000 for us. So we were like, we've got something here. <laughs> we should probably figure out a little bit more of that. So um, that just initial ability to be nimble and respond to a request that I got from mm -hmm. another team that um, thankfully our team is really 
super collaborative spirit. We've talked a lot about like firewall issues and, and making sure we, I have great appreciation for firewall and ethics and journalism, um, but I'm also extremely appreciative that our content team goes above and beyond to help do these kinds of asks and approaches me with ideas. Mm -hmm. And then I can just help them figure out the best way to execute that because that's that's what I'm there for is to support them and figure out the best way to bring in revenue for their team. Um, and so now we've just continued to kind of iterate and build off of that initial one tracking link. Um, we, we've tested things with premiums, we've um, experimented with bonus feeds, and we actually had an initial conversation with Merit Glow and the university bureaucracy that was earlier <laughs> mentioned kind of ran into um, some conflicts. And so we had to do really technical workarounds to figure out how to do the bonus feed delivery, which, oh, I could go all the way into we, that if anybody we will we'll get that. That We will get back to the fun. Yeah. And I think also the, the great area of bonus feeds and, and yeah. that, I'll kind of dig into that in a little bit, I think. Yep. Um, probably worth asking, like by a show of hands, is anybody in the room doing podcast fundraising right now? So a good number. Um, so I think one of the things um, for, for those that aren't, I think there's probably a couple of like 101 stuff that we, we might want to hit. Uh, and something that came up definitely in my time um, during WMYC was when do you start to ask for money on a podcast? Like, what is the opportune moment? If we, if we look back, it was brought up earlier today, like um, for public radio, the, the conversion cycle for a member can be up to seven years, five to seven years. Um, and definitely my experience from podcasts hasn't been that it, it's that long. But mm -hmm. um, it, Rebecca, would be great to hear, like, I, I think the first time that I heard the asks on New Hampshire Public Radio podcast was for Bear Brook. And it was right there. Episode from, one, at the beginning of the episode. So <laughs> could you talk a little bit just about how you got to that decision, who was involved in that decision, and, and the sign-off for that, and maybe, like, some of the great stats that you have? Sure. So... Um, Bear Brook is an unparalleled success at NHPR, something that, frankly, everybody on the content side knew would be the case. Um, it's, at this point, almost 11 million downloads worldwide. It's a limited series. Um, originally, it was supposed to be like six or eight episodes. It ended up being a little bit longer because... P.S., another big impact of the podcast was it actually helped solve the case, and so we had to do some reporting around that. Um, but one of the things that I knew from my work in true crime, I'm a true crime author, or the podcast that I make is actually about true crime podcasts, um, is that it is very motivating for a formatic narrative show, whether it's true crime or any kind of really compelling narrative show, a thing that a listener who's really engaged with the content will want right away is the next episode. They'll want that binge experience. So the concept behind Bear Brook was, um, and again, I just want to underline something that you said earlier, or Kirsten said, is that the content team was integrated into the process from the beginning. Like, we went to them and said, would you be willing to do this? And, and then, what would you be willing to do? And the concept was, that you would donate 20 bucks one time tip jar model, which we didn't invent, we stole it from Serial, who um, basically deployed an episode four of the most popular podcast ever made, Serial, and they basically said, do you like this? Do you want us to make more? Give us 20 bucks. And they had an enormous uh, fundraising haul from that and conversion rate. And I knew that they didn't pull that out of nowhere because they have this very sophisticated fundraising operation at the This American Life shop. But um, So I was just like, let's do what they did. Uh, why not? A similarly formatic, narrative, true crime podcast. And what we decided to uh, try to offer was the next episode right now, if you gave 20 bucks. So we created a bonus feed, um, very low tech, easily bootleggable. But we decided <laughs> we didn't care because if someone was bootlegging our bonus feed, like that's good, right? Like, for creating something that addictive. Um, so at the time, I mean, we had the tools like you're making were not available to us at the time. So um, yeah, so we decided, right, at, initially we put the ask at the end of episode one, at the end of the credits, and then we were just looking at the data in Apple Podcasts and listened through, right? We realized people were dumping when the credits were over, maybe before the last note of the music. So after the podcast was out for a week, we moved it right to the beginning of the episode, repeated it at the end. And we saw some really high conversion. I mean, the first couple of episodes when the podcast was really taking off, more than 1% conversion. Um, and I kind of developed this other metric of like uh, dollars per listener because I, I'm thinking like less about conversion rates of people because the podcast life cycle, it lives out in the world forever. Mm -hmm. And you can't always offer that next episode right away because at some point there aren't 
additional episodes, but Bear Brook right now today, months after its release, is still being downloaded 600,000 times a month. So the ask should stay. The message has changed. Uh, but we've raised about uh, 50,000 bucks in $20 donations from that podcast. So it's been a really interesting and fun thing to see develop and, and you know, experiment. And I think that was one of the the great things about it to think about, obviously you were using as that, that transactional piece at the start was get more episodes now for your gift. But right. the fact that after that doesn't work after six weeks right. of the show coming out. And right. so for people still to be saying like, this is an experiment I want to invest in, at the moment they have that closest relationship with the content. With Jason. So Jason Moon in particular, the host of the podcast, is the guide through the show. And this is something that any creator knows well in this medium. And you know, the other thing that I'll say, it really helped this process is, uh, and I would encourage any station leader to think about this when you're thinking about these efforts, the people who are creating your podcast and your content teams listen to more podcasts than anybody else in your organization. They know what these things sound like in other podcasts. They know what they connect with as a listener. They know what listeners will tolerate. They are more familiar with the industry, very likely, than your you know, membership team or your underwriting team because they are probably your heaviest consumers. And Jason and Taylor, the producer of the podcast, really design the messages to be tight, to be very personal, and to frankly like show a little bit of vulnerability. Like, you guys, you know, we really uh, so much appreciate you listening to this. It was a, a risk that our station took, and we want to send the signal that our station should take more of these risks. So if you like what you hear, give us 20 bucks. And it's, like, it's not super hard, but it's, it's more transparent. They're not driving home the mission of New Hampshire Public Radio. They don't talk about it being like an NHPR product overtly. It's about that particular show, mm -hmm. the relationship the listener has with it, and if you want more, want us to make something like it, please help. Yeah, I think that the messaging piece is, is a really important piece, obviously. Like, un, um, different to broadcast, you know, terrestrial radio, where we have the bullhorn, the opportunity to interrupt a listener's um, daily experience, daily relationship with your show by putting messaging into, you know, every hour, every 30 minutes, constantly changing the message and evolving it through the day to capture as many gifts as possible. The relationship with your podcast listeners is on demand, it's on their terms, and God damn it, they have a skip button. <laughs> yep. um, and so creating an authentic ask, creating a reason to stick around and listen to get to that ask is that little, like, very key important thing. And, and Kirsten, I know you, um, you work, I want to say hands off, that's probably not the right term, but with your, <laughs> with your content creators to kind of give them the guidance, but yeah. to, to really invest in them as content creators for the ask as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I think everybody knows any good fundraising ask is a good story that people connect with emotionally and feel invested in in the moment, and that's what drives them to give. And so um, when we started approaching doing asks in our podcasts, I basically sent them a bulleted list of here's a few talking points that you should definitely hit home with. Like, we do mention that it's a KOW product in our asks usually because we and to skirt around the restricted fundraising rules with our finance department a little bit. So supporting the podcast, which is made by KOW Public Radio, made possible by it. Um, but I, So I gave them a few template things like that, but um, I really want to encourage them to make it their own and to relate it back to why they love creating it because that's what people are going to relate to. And so my favorite ask, uh, there's a lot of great asks, but I'm going to single out one in particular is by our producer, Matt Martin, um, who's a producer for The Wild, which is also our first podcast that hit a million downloads, yay. Um, and it was, there's season, season one, episode one of The Wild. Um, the episode starts with Matt getting stung by bees as they hunt out this cougar den. Um, and so in his ask that he wrote, I sent him the bullet points and like, here's what you definitely need to touch on. And so he produced a spot and sent it back and like, let, he's like, let me know what you think. And he talked about like, I'm the guy who got stung by bees in the first episode. And despite that, I love what I do. And um, goes on to tell this like really compelling like ask about why you should support that kind of content coming from KOW and it's just it's authentic and that's the big thing is people can tell when you're not being real and they're not being authentic just like when you're on the radio but I think even more so because it is so intimate it's in your ears and it's following you around through different parts of your day and so if you don't strike that right authentic tone in a really clear and concise way like you're saying of like hey this this content takes money to create and we we need you to support it if you want more of it 
people respond to that really well because it's it's true, it's authentic, mm -hmm. and if you can relate it back to the storytelling that they're hearing and enjoying in that moment, I think that's like the perfect recipe. We had a, um, and do you mind if I just, we, so we had an outside in our <laughs> podcast, which is about you know, the outdoors, but it's also very sort of, in a way it's sort of subversive, very fun, very fresh. Sam is like the guiding, the host is the guiding person. He produced a fundraising spot for a fundraiser they did last year that I think raised about $17,000, where he cast our COO as a villain on the spot. <laughs> he went and did like a real interview with him, and our COO was like doing all this like tech talk about how do we scale this? How do we make this a sustainable business model? And Sam just it, like interrupted in the voiceover and was like, you hear that? Like, that's the man trying to keep our podcast down. Like, <laughs> like not exactly that, but like, you know, we want to help us show our station leadership that this work matters and that you will support he was, it was so, and Zach, thank goodness, has a sense of humor and was cool with it, but like it, it was a piece of content in the right. podcast. Like the other way to do it is to make it a piece of content in the podcast. I mean, in best case scenario, everybody's super on board and wants to do that. But in a world where, imagine, uh, your content teams <laughs> at the station don't have infinite time and are crunching on deadlines to get every episode of the podcast out. Wonder if anyone's familiar with that. Um, how do you build the case for to make time for this? What, why, why should the creators be as invested in that story of of membership? Uh, you know, the mission. What I think is very much the mission and vision of the reasons behind the content creation to step up and do the additional work of making something um, moving enough to get someone to pay attention and give. And I wonder, yeah, Mira, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Piece of content, or, or talking about why you got stung by a bee and should <laughs> get paid for it. Um, th those are those are really incredible ways to make an ask, but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a piece of content. You know, th these things can be pretty simple and straightforward, and, and we you know we have a script for it. And and the idea is, you know, it, it, the call to action should come early. It should come often. Mm -hmm. It should, and and it can be long. <laughs> you know, like and if you just sit down and write out a paragraph that says. You know, here's why we do what we do. It costs money. Here's specifically what costs money, and here's how you know. Here's how you can support it. People would be surprised at how many listeners engage with that. And so it doesn't have to be a contrived exercise. It can be something that takes ten minutes, but it's just a good piece of content and writing that really strikes the listener in their ear. And those convert incredibly well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it doesn't have to be really difficult to put, put together this call to action. But the other thing, as you're pitching the content team, isn't just about the money that they can raise, but when you're getting people to engage with you and support the show, it's also an indicator of, of how, how much are they enjoying it? Like, how well are you activating your audience and how connected do they feel with the goal of what you're doing? And so, you know, our hosts get really excited when they see a new payment come in, not just because it's new money, but because they're like, man, that person liked my show enough that they actually pulled money out of their pocket and said thank you for it. And you know what I can do? I can email them and say thank you also. And so it gives you a way not just of getting more money for the show, but getting a way to engage more deeply with your audience. And those people can go into your broader membership funnels, and you can hit them up all the time as you're talking about your broader station goals. And so it's, it's a really good way to move not just from, to move into engagement. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to bring up because obviously we're talking about revenue a lot today. Revenue is not always, uh, hear me today, give me some money, like right now. Um, but there, there is a membership funnel. And I think it's also important to point out, just to be honest, like the terms of making podcasts within the public media system are different to being independent. And it's very, very few occasions where a show will be a million dollar show and support every single uh, element of production through individual giving and small gifts. Um, and so I wonder, like, what is that bigger conversation about membership as who these people are in terms of who's going to stay in that funnel and become a member and a believer and a lover of your station, who might not and is that okay, and who are those people maybe who are coming in and they're going to be the lifetime promoters of any content you make, if you want to jump in, Kirsten. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off with just um, anybody who gives to any one of our podcast dedicated forms goes into our content management system and into our database, just like any other donor. So they are considered a member right off the bat, whether it's $5. And we even tried a little bit of the 2 or $3 a month donation just to see, just to see how people took it. Um, and I think what we... See, there's a lot of different definitions of membership throughout the entire system and every station defines it a little bit differently. Um, and yes, there is like, we want more sustainers and we want a certain number goal, but 
what I saw in, in our data was actually we were getting a lot of lapsed rejoin members. So these are people who had drifted away from our content or drifted away from membership, but maybe we're still kind of casually listening. But this podcast re-engaged them. And going back to that piece about highly engaged audiences, um, you know, one of our podcasts, Battle Tactics for Your Success Workplace, was our most successful fundraising podcast, but it wasn't necessarily a huge download audience. But what we saw was that people were highly engaged with the content, they had a great Facebook community, and they were really excited about the idea of like supporting something new and different. And so we saw a really great mm -hmm. success with that. So, and that builds community and brand loyalty around not just the podcast brand, but also the home of the podcast. So I, I think membership tends to be this kind of nebulous term that everybody's mm -hmm. like, oh, really know like this person is not a member and this person isn't and I, I think you have to be okay with just getting like the one twenty dollar donation every now and then and then that person <coughs> dips out it was the same conversation I had with people around initiating Facebook fundraisers at our station they're like oh well we can't steward these people and we can't you know effectively track their information and we can't add them to our donation funnel I'm um, but we launched Facebook fundraisers a little over a year ago, and it's we've we've seen pretty considerable revenue and interesting um, implications around like the birthday fundraisers of its money that we wouldn't have gotten any other way if we weren't doing the ask at that point in time. So I think just being open to and you know letting go of that fear of like not doing the way the things way you've always done them is really important, and just having that flexibility of sometimes you aren't going to get the most robust data or the most success metrics. But that doesn't mean there isn't something to learn from it. I think the biggest takeaway for us has just been. Um, regardless of the dollar amounts or the metrics has been this collaboration between teams and the culture that it's created mm -hmm. of people know to come to me to ask for help. And even though there is a firewall, they know that I'm an ally and that I'm there to support them. And that's just like, I think that's been the biggest success of all um, of our efforts. So I think just kind of today, fire, firewall is a word we've used a lot today, I think. Um, and, and I think where it puts uh, my head and we had a little bit of a chit chat about this before we came out. but. Um, you know, creating incentives and urgency in some cases has led to having a binge mode as, as an offer or bonus content that might be first uh, seemingly behind a paywall before it comes into the actual feed. Mm -hmm. Now, as a public media um, world, it is our job to open up content to listeners and to provide uh, equal access, I think, both to voices who are telling those stories, but also to people who are hearing them. You know, that is our mandate, our mission and vision. So, um, but to say that there are probably gray areas, people who give a lot of money and get station tours are getting a different kind of relationship to the open access to the host that people who are only giving uh, an incredible seven or $10 a month gift. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how are you thinking about navigating that, Rebecca? So we uh, have had a lot of conversations about this internally, and we actually put out a podcast, Patient Zero, this year, which was a really successful show in terms of audience numbers, and we decided to do a paywall feed for that show with a uh, regular gift. And um, the conversation that we had internally was, we will put things behind the paywall that we wouldn't have been making if the paywall didn't exist. So we're not holding anything back that was going to be released in these episodes. What we were doing was, for instance, uh, taking tape, maybe that an episode that was too long or at, where it veered into a different topic that was also interesting but didn't fit in the narrative uh, arc. Taylor would then craft that as an episode for that feed. Um, and then if anyone asked about it, we could say, like, we are not holding anything back from you uh, that was intended to be public. We are just providing access to something that wasn't, in, you know, that wasn't made for that purpose. We did actually end up putting one of the bonus episodes outside the firewall because ultimately we decided it was important. It was uh, actually answered a question that a lot of listeners were asking we saw on social media. And it did provide full transparency, a little bit of production relief for the team that really needed to take a week to like finish another one. And so pulling that episode out also helped with that. Um, but it's definitely a conversation. And it's definitely, again, a resource issue. We're talking about it now with Outside In, one of our other teams, because there's a lot of opportunity there, I think, for a more personal interaction with mm -hmm. Sam and the audience. Uh, as a paid feed, but they can't make content that isn't as good. I mean, this is the way we are in HPR. We can't make bonus content that isn't as good as our content. Mm -hmm. So we have to, I think that we've kind of drawn a line 
um, when we've talked about fundraising around this with our fundraising team and that collaborative conversation, that if we can't resource it, it it's hard to make the case to do it. Um, but I'll tell you on the private side of podcasting, the audience is very, very tiny behind the firewall, but you don't need a big audience to make a lot of money. So there is a very compelling case to at least experiment. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have 15 minutes left, so we might switch to the questions on the big giant magic screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I could start with one right in front of us. Um, somebody asked if we could provide examples of excellent independent po podcasts who fundraise well. Who's got one? I've got one that is not one that I listen to, but that our emerging platforms producer always talks about, and it's Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. So yes, it's about Harry Potter, but um, but uh, I I mean, and I'll just say like a lot of us are probably podcast consumers, mm -hmm. and so if you're listening to a podcast and you're struck by like how they're doing the ass, like note that. What did you like about that? What got you? Because chances are you know your audience very well. And it's not as different from a radio ask as you might think. It's just a little more intimate and you can be a little bit more carefree with it, which is exciting and fun. You can be a little more creative. Um, and so I think listen to like expand, like mm -hmm. search it out on see who the top creators are on Patreon or see who's collaborating with Glow and see, um, you know, I think you all have some success examples yeah. on your site too. So, I mean, you, there's tons of resources out there, but I think catching yourself when you're struck by something in the moment and noting that, like that's what's gonna move the needle for you is recognizing when it catches you. Yeah. When I, I can talk about sort of our, our first client that you know, they've, they've uh, decided to make their numbers public, which is a show called Acquired. It's a show about technology. And so they do two regular episodes a month and then they do two bonus episodes a month, which are, is content they would not have made otherwise. It's sort of raw and cut. The two hosts sort of get on the phone with each other and talk about the latest things they're seeing in tech. And what they've done is a, a few things really well. One is they've sort of established the call to action at the beginning of every show. And so it comes right after um, right after their pre-roll ad and they talk about sort of what the bonus episode is that month and refer to it specifically and provide a call to action specifically about what that bonus content is going to be like. They also have gotten really creative about ways that they promote the show using other channels. So for example, every once in a while they'll drop a piece of the bonus content into their sort of regular feed, um, which, which when they do, we see a lot of uptick in traction in their conversions. And similarly, as we have other shows that have started these um, started membership programs, they almost always see a lot of success when they create an episode specifically for making a call to action. So they might have an episode dropped in the feed that says, it's Giving Tuesday, here's why you should donate to this podcast. And it might be a two or three minute episode, but it's there specifically to make the feed. Uh, and then they'll wrap up that content and share it out on social media with an audience. And so what a lot of our most successful podcasts are doing is they're taking uh, their asks, they're, they're changing it sort of from week to week based on whatever they're offering that week, and then they're finding different ways to reshare the ask on different social media channels. And, and that podcast I refer to, they, they have about 5% conversion, uh, so they're making uh, you know, close to $50,000 a year through their, their uh, bonus show. Do you have a favorite? Um, I know some really clever people in podcasting. One of the most clever is a guy named Patrick Hines who basically built his show to be a money maker from the beginning, which is not the way that public radio would ever build a show or I would ever build a show, except that he's also making a really good and popular show and has and integrated all the tricks. And they basically, uh, he has a show, it's a comedy podcast, sort of looks at true crime documentaries. They actually tackle a lot of social issues, but it's very, very funny. It's called True Crime Obsessed. And they have basically created a parallel content feed behind the paywall where they review things that they do one-off things in their regular episodes, but then they review series behind the paywall. So they can, you know, they do like a Netflix thing this week's show, but then right now behind the paywall, we're doing the jinx episode by episode. So they've actually very cleverly created a more addictive experience behind their paywall than their one-off episodes. Like I can just dip in and out of listening to True Crime Obsessed whenever I want, but if I'm addicted, I have to get behind the paywall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I'll just throw in, well, I, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was um, at WMC as the senior manager of, of membership for podcasts, desperately calling people. Anytime I heard a membership message in, a, in any kind of show, I would try and reach out to the people who'd written it to the show. That's how I connected with you both, just obsessively <laughs> tracking things down. Um, but um, I think people who have been around for a lot longer have been able to build a much uh, bigger community of giving to really build... Um, that cumulative money. And there's a show called The, the Black Guy Who Tips, Rod and Karen. 
are a couple who host it and they built an entire behind the wall second stream. Rod had lost his job, he started making the podcast. It is now their like revenue generation source at home. And it is such an incredible sense of building a, a business um, through membership and understanding that service role to your uh, audience, what they want to hear, what you want to talk about. I just, I love finding those stories. I would say like, like you say, like we can learn so much from how people are taking what we do at, at public radio and adapt it to the outside space. Right, I mean, another great experience in that vein is letting the audience participate mm -hmm. if, if behind the firewall. Because you might not want phone tape in your podcast, but you might want to really engage with a person who isn't that engaged with you. The hyper service, I cannot stress enough with podcast donations how much hyper service matters because Netflix is also asking you for money every month and they're not hyper servicing you. They're just putting out shows. Um, Serial, I donated $20 to in 2014 and I'm still getting very regular, very personal communications from them. And to me, that has been like an incredible object, like lesson in how yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. So I realize we have 19 questions and I just took up so much time. <laughs> oh boy. Slide, so I apologize, I apologize. But so I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, do this one quick. Everyone gets one question. Um, I'd love to hear a worst attempt, a reality check at fundraising on a show. Who feels brave? I mean, we, I've got one that I won't name the name of the show, but <laughs> not, I think they'd be fine with it. But um, we had an ask that sounded way too much like the episode. Like it was too seamless. It was too huh. much in the host's voice. It wasn't clear enough. It was like, it was kind of like maybe people thought it was still part of the episode, so it was a little bit of a bait and switch when the ass came at the end. Um, and so that one just did not do it well. I will say also that um, with like our our local podcast, like our sound cues, we just haven't seen as much traction. And I think part of that has to do with not having a regular enough cadence of asks in the episodes. Um, our traffic manager is working on revamping our entire inventory system to make sure that we can get all these messages that people want to go. Because we do use the engagement ladder strategy of we're, we're asking people to review, we're asking people to take surveys, and we're asking people to donate through our podcast. So, um, you know, we're, we're still working on that right mixture of, mm -hmm. of we do try to ask early, um, but we are still trying to find that right mixture of just the right voice where it's authentic enough but doesn't blend too much into the episode and the ask is at the right time. I mean, uh, I did see this question come up. It's not on the screen right now, but somebody asked about donor fatigue. How much is too much asking? Because at the point of tuning out and stuff, like, wh where's your threshold? Well, I mean, what do you, what, you say that even after Bear Brook had finished, like, it's still a good role to yeah. have an ask up, keep it up there. Well, it's 10 seconds. It's 10 seconds. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. it, it, it fits within the fast forward button thing. And I am totally cool with people fast forwarding past it. Like, that's fine. Um, I think that uh, doing campaigns at set, my opinion, is that doing campaigns at set times of the year, like we do on public radio, is not the right fit mm -hmm. for podcasting. I think it's very content dependent. I think you should do it when your content fits doing it. Um, our successful outside-in fundraiser was very much at a time where the show was doing some really interesting stuff, and we felt really comfortable. I know the team felt very comfortable going on a limb with their asks. One of the asks at that point was for $500 to go on a hike with Sam, and it sold out. Um, and it really felt like a fit with the content. And we did a parallel fundraiser at the same time with another show that was much more popular, Civics 101. But there was really no reason to give at that time, I mean, outside in, at like the time of year, it felt right. And Civics 101, it just didn't, the asks were great, and it just didn't feel like it fit the content at that mm -hmm. time. So I, I am, my opinion is, and you know, this is not coming from the public radio membership side, I've never pretended to be an expert <laughs> in that, is that unlike with the donation schedule of the on-air drives, you really need to work with your content teams and think about what they're producing, when they're producing it, and match your fundraising to what they believe their peaks of interest, peaks of listenership, peaks of them being willing to put themselves out there are. And I feel like there's a, a, a part that, you know, I think as a lot of us are stepping into or have stepped into from the public media space into podcasts, not everything is an ongoing weekly or bi-weekly show. If there is seasonality, it changes the rules of engagement and the opportunity to fundraise. Um, to that point, like Amira, like just thinking about like who you're working with and, and, and what you've been kind of exposed to, how do you account for the, those differences in a seasonality of a show and something that's maybe just going to be eight episodes to something ongoing? And, and even like if we can maybe speak to a little bit about like how that might speak to when someone should be asking, which I would imagine you would say straight away. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I, I think people should ask straight away. I mean, I think you, uh, 
in, in general, you have nothing to lose. And I think almost everyone I work with underestimates their ability to be able to draw in revenue from their asks. And so the question of like, are you hitting donor fatigue? When should you ask? I I rarely run into a case of a show that we work with that is asking too much. In most cases, they're asking too little. They're being too shy. They're not even making the ask. And so it's really important. Pe people can't support what you do unless unless they know you're providing it. That said, because certain show, you know, because the seasonality of certain shows or um, some are just limited run series in podcasting, I think just getting to know sort of the public media environment, my personal opinion is some shows are really well made for some kind of sustaining membership and others are really great cases to ask for a one-time donation or maybe you know, a donation throughout the course of when the episode is going to, or when the series is going to run and to stop there. A lot of your audience with podcasting is going to be broader than the audience that you might normally get through the the public radio station. And so realizing that you might be able to tap into someone from a different state, maybe you're tapping in from Alaska or Oklahoma or Nebraska, maybe that's your one engagement with your station. And so the ask doesn't necessarily need to be become a sustaining member. Maybe the ask is make that one time push and you know we'll we'll make that money from you, but we'll also have you sort of in our email list forever. We'll be able to reach back out to you. Maybe if there's a new season of this uh, of this podcast or cross promote another show that we have. And so the question is how do you take you know, your one-off engagement with someone who might not make sense initially as a standing member and figure out how to just capture that instead of maybe eight impressions you have from the outset. I think that feeds into really nicely to the how do you measure success, downloads, impressions, donations, um, and sponsors is also in here. I, I think and I, I'd love you to talk about that a bit, Kirsten. I would also love to just kind of framing in, in an ideal you know, world on the membership for the terrestrial side, we've built models, we've been fundraising for years. There's a way to look at what is success and what is a failure? Um, how are you building that in this kind of like continual testing phase while audiences are still growing and podcast listening? That's a great question. We're still figuring that out. Um, that's part of <laughs> that's part of the always testing because you know I set dollar goals that I am trying to hit and everything, but I also am like might not hit those. Um, so there's also a lot of messiness of like, we've been going through a huge transition with our content management system. We changed donor databases. Um, and then we were even, we some of our podcasts are through PRX and some of them are through our own system. So uh, we have metrics all over the place that don't exactly line up. So um, our emerging platforms producer, Claire McGrain and I have been working together to I poll weekly donation reports that show um, whether or not people took pre Premiums, whether they were new, renewing, lapse, rejoin, or ad gift. Um, and then she tries to work her magic and match that up a little bit with like audience and listenership data. But we haven't quite found because of just the way the information is relayed to us at this point. It's not an exact mm -hmm. match. Um, but we are able to say like, hey, we had a huge spike in donations this week. Did we start running an ask again after it hadn't been running for a while? And we're able to go back and kind of be like, okay, what was different this week than last week? Um, and then her and I are still working. You know, she did a really great survey of one of our podcasts of the listeners, and we gave away posters that were signed as an incentive. Um, and that got us a lot of really interesting, like age information that we were missing elsewhere, what was driving people to donate. And I'm happy to talk more about that process afterwards. That everybody. feels like the perfect information <laughs> gap to leave the audience with. I know we're yeah. over time. <laughs> um, but thank you, Kirsten. Thank yeah. you, Mira. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody. Oh.